You're listening to KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The time is 9 p.m. After this message, stay tuned for, uh (laughs) uh-oh, stay tuned for suspense. You're invited to join the KPFA team for our largest, most exciting annual off-air event, the KPFA Crafts Fair. We need friendly and reliable volunteers to help at the doors and to assist exhibitors and visitors at the fair. On Friday, December 13th, we welcome assistance in setting up from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. On Sunday, December 14th, we need help from 6.45 a.m. through 6.30 p.m. And on Sunday, December 15th, from 8 a.m. through 9 p.m. This event takes place at the Concourse at 8th and Brandon in San Francisco. And it's a great opportunity for you to attend as KPFA's guest. And thanks for working a three-hour shift at the Crafts Fair. If you'd like to pitch in and sign up for a shift, call Felix at 510-848-6767, extension 629, or email volunteer at kpfa.org. As always, we appreciate your help and hope to see you there. Tonight, we take pleasure in bringing you Suspense, a weekly anthology of notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in Suspense. May 8th, 1889. What a lovely day. I have spent all the morning lying on the grass in front of my house under the enormous plantain tree which shelters the whole of it. From my windows I can see the Seine, which flows by the side of my garden and almost through my grounds. The great and wide Seine, which is covered with boats passing to and fro. On the left lies Rouen, populous ruin with its blue roofs massed under potted gothic towers. Innumerable are they, all dominated by the spire of the cathedral, full of bells which sound through the blue air on fine mornings, sending their sweet and distant iron clang to me. What a wonderful morning. I was almost sorry when Marie, my housemaid, interrupted me. Your luncheon is ready, monsieur? Oh, thank you, Marie. But it seems almost a pity to go inside the house. Isn't it a perfect day, Marie? Oh, yes, monsieur. And the view, oh, it's beyond compare. I do so love to watch the boats go by on the Seine. Really? Oh, so do I. Please, s- sit a moment and join me. Oh, thank you, monsieur. Do you know about the different types of vessels, Marie? No, monsieur, I'm not well versed in such things. Ah, well, see, these two, the ones with the red flags, these are English schooners. And there, that uh, magnificent white (laughs) three-master, it's being drawn by a steam tug no bigger than a fly. (laughs) Yes, monsieur, uh, it's magnifique. So uh, white, so perfectly clean and shining. Indeed it is. And see the flag, that ship, it's Brazilian. (laughs) Just think of the long voyage it has had from South America to pass by our gate. Oh, you love this place very much, don't you, monsieur? Yes, I truly do, Marie. This place, the, the home in which I grew up, I do. I love it so. I'm attached to it by the deep roots, uh, profound and delicate, which attach a man to the soil on which his ancestors were born and died. I must sound like a poet. <laughs> What you sound like, monsieur, is someone whose luncheon will get cold if he doesn't come in and eat. All right, all right, Marie. I'll come in. (laughs) 
May 20th. For some reason, I've had a slight feverish attack the last few days, and I feel low-spirited and ill. I have continually a horrible feeling of impending danger, of apprehension of some coming misfortune or approaching death. <laughs> I've never experienced anything like this before. And my dreams... My dreams have become most troubling. Hmm. What? What? Who is there? Monsieur, it's Marie. No, oh, just a moment. Yes? Are you all right? Uh, you were screaming and calling out. You wake the servants. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, uh, I was having a nightmare. <laughs> a nightmare, monsieur? Uh, yes, a nightmare. Marie, if you dreamed that someone was looking at you and touching you and taking your neck in his hands and squeezing it, and squeezing it with all his might in order to strangle you, don't you think you would cry out too? Oh, yes, monsieur. I'm sure I should. Yes, of course you would. So, But I, I do apologize. Please, uh, tell the servants that I shall try to be more quiet. Yes, monsieur. Uh, so your uh, visit to the doctor was of no help? <laughs> no. He examined me. He told me that well, while my pulse is rapid and my eyes are slightly dilated, I, I am otherwise in splendid health. <laughs> When I asked him why, when evening comes on, a feeling of oppression seizes me, as if night concealed something horrible. The doctor claimed that it was nothing more than indigestion. So he prescribed a bromide of potassium and a course of cold shower baths daily. Indigestion? Shower baths? Well, that is ridiculous. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, monsieur. Perhaps I speak out of turn. No need to apologize, Marie. In truth, I do not believe it myself. Yesterday, when I was walking in the forest of Rumer, it suddenly seemed as if I was being followed, that uh, someone was walking at my heels, close, quite close to me. He was near enough to touch me, and yet, when I turned around, I saw nothing, nothing behind me but the path between the tall trees, just horribly empty. Can that be explained by indigestion? Oh, no, monsieur, I do not think so. Nor do I. But what rational explanation is there? Am I merely afflicted with some manner of nervous condition? Or are there things in this world, sinister shadows that remain hidden to us? How profound the mystery of the invisible is. We cannot fathom it with our miserable senses. Our, our eyes are unable to perceive what is either too small or too great. Too near or too far from us, we can see neither the inhabitants of a star nor a drop of water. <laughs> ah, first a poet and now a philosopher. But always a thoughtful and gracious gentleman, monsieur. Thank you, Marie. And thank you for checking on me. But please, go back to bed. Very well, monsieur. Uh, can I get you anything before I go? No, no, it's all right. I'll just have a glass of water and try to go back to sleep. Marie, look, my water carafe. Your water carafe? Yes. It was full. I, I know it was full when I went to bed. Yes, monsieur, I filled it last night. But now it's empty. I haven't touched, and yet it's empty. But how can that be? Someone has been in this room. Someone or something drank that water. Oh, I do not know who could have, monsieur. Neither I nor any of the other servants have entered here. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you drank the water in your sleep. Yes, yes. I must have drank it myself, of course. That is it. Shall I get you some more? No. No, it's all right. I'll be fine. Good night, Marie. Good night, monsieur. June 15th. My state has grown worse. Much worse. 
The bromide and the shower bath have had no effect whatsoever. As evening comes on, an incomprehensible feeling of disquietude seizes me. I try to read, but I do not understand the words, and can scarcely distinguish the letters. So I walk the floors of my drawing room, oppressed by confused and irresistible fears. A fear of sleep, and a fear of my bed. But, eventually, sleep comes, and with it a recurring nightmare that somebody is strangling the life from me. I struggle, bound by the terrible powerlessness which paralyzes us in our dreams. I try to cry out, to move, to turn over and throw off this being which is suffocating me, but I cannot. So, I have decided to leave first thing in the morning, in the hopes that a change of environment will assuage my condition. Ah, there you are. And you're just in time. Part of the reason I was so insistent that you attend this evening is that we have a special guest, Dr. Perrin, a specialist in nervous diseases and the extraordinary manifestations produced by hypnotism and suggestion. You think that perhaps my own condition could be related? Perhaps, cousin. At any rate, it may give you food for thought. Oh, come, he's about to start. <clears throat> we are on the point of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature, or at least one of its most important secrets on this earth. For assuredly, there are some in the stars of a different measure of importance, eh? Ever since man has been able to express and write down his thoughts, he has felt himself close to a mystery which is impenetrable to his coarse and imperfect senses and he has endeavored to supplement these senses by the efforts of his intellect. As long as that intellect remained in its elementary stage, this intercourse with invisible spirits led to popular belief in the supernatural. But, for more than a century now, men seem to have had the presentiment of something new. Mesmer and some others have put us on an unexpected track, and within the last two or three years especially, we have arrived at results really surprising. Madame Sable, would you like me to try and send you to sleep? <laughs> yes, certainly. Very well. You must let your mind go completely blank and look fixedly into my eyes. Now, you are going to sleep. Sleep, 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 sleep. You see? Her eyes are becoming heavier at my instruction. Sleep, sleep, sleep. There. Now she is asleep. Monsieur, if you would please go behind her. Uh, but of course... See this? Nothing more than a visiting card. I place it in Madame Sable's hands. This is a looking glass. What do you see in it? I see my cousin. What is he doing? He is twisting his mustache. Oh, very good. Now, when you awaken, you will take your cousin aside and ask him to lend you 5,000 francs, which your husband asks of you for his upcoming journey. It is a life or death matter. You must have the money. Now, awaken. What? Cousin, I must speak with you in private of a matter most urgent. Yes, but of course. Dear guests, Please excuse us for just a moment. My dear cousin, I must ask a great favor of you. What is it, cousin? I do not like to tell you, and yet I must. I, I am in absolute want of 5,000 francs. <laughs> what? You? We, oui. I, or rather, my husband was asked me to procure them for him. 
Your husband is colonel of the 76th Chasseur and a very wealthy man. Has he not 5,000 francs at his disposal? Come, think. Are you sure that he commissioned you to ask me for them? Yes. Yes, I am quite sure of it. He has uh, written to you? I, I do not know. So your husband runs into debt? I do not know. But please, for the love of God, I must have the francs. Do you remember what took place just a few minutes ago? How Dr. Parent sent you to sleep? Yes. When you were asleep, he ordered you to borrow 5,000 francs from me. And at this moment, you are obeying his suggestion. But, but it is my husband who wants them. Cousin, this is just hypnotic suggestion. No, my husband. I know he must be in dire need of those francs. I beseech you, dear cousin. Dr. Perron, there you are. You must do something. Cousin, please, the francs. I will put her to sleep and remove the suggestion. Afterwards, all will be as it was before. Please, do so at once. This is diabolical. Actually, this demonstration was for your benefit. Madame Sabre mentioned your condition to me. Cousin! This is nothing like what afflicts me. But Madame Sabre said that... Whatever haunts my nights and seeks to take control of me, it is not human. July 23rd. I am doomed. Or perhaps mad. For I feel my will being overwhelmed bit by bit so that I am no longer my own master. Certainly this is the way my poor cousin felt. Possessed and swayed under the power of a parasitic and ruling soul. But what plagues me is no mere hypnotic suggestion. No, it is something not of this world, something infinitely insidious and patient, and its effect upon me. <laughs> Picture to yourself a sleeping man who is being murdered, who wakes up with a knife in his chest, a gurgling in his throat, he is covered with blood, can no longer breathe, is going to die and does not understand anything about it at all. That sleeping man is me. Who? Who is this murderer? This invisible being that rules me? This unknowable being? This rover of a supernatural race? Yes, sir, come in. Monsieur, you haven't eaten all day. So I've brought you some supper. Please have something. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mary. Yeah, just put it on the table, please. Yes, monsieur. Unknown inhabitants of the ancient and modern world by Dr. Erman Aristos. I have been doing certain uh, researches, uh, looking for possible explanations for this malady which plagues me. Mary, I am convinced that this is no psychological terror but an actual physical being. Monsieur? I have just read the following in the Revue des Mondes Scientifiques. A curious piece of news comes to us from Rio de Janeiro. An epidemic of madness, which may be compared to that uh, contagious madness which attacks the people of Europe in the Middle Ages. It is at this moment raging in the province of San Paulo. The frightened inhabitants are leaving their houses deserting their villages, abandoning their land, saying that they are pursued, possessed, governed, like human cattle by invisible beings, a species of vampire which feeds on their life while they are asleep. I do not understand, monsieur. This epidemic, what the villagers are fleeing from, it sounds exactly like the unseen devil that plagues me. But uh, these events, they, they've transpired in Brazil an ocean away. How could they be related? How could one of those invisible beings come to inhabit this house? Do you remember that day in May, when we were sitting on the grass out front, watching the boats on the Seine? 
the day we saw that magnificent three master, so white and bright. Yes, I remember. That three master came from Brazil. One of those invisible beings, he was on board of her, and he saw me, and he saw this house, which is also a bright white, and he sprang from the ship onto the land. He came here. Monsieur, I, I suppose it is possible. That the three master came from Brazil is, is quite a coincidence, but uh, are you quite certain that there is no other explanation? What is reported as happening to the villagers in Brazil is exactly what I have been suffering. Just last night, I felt somebody leaning on me, sucking my life from me like a vampire. Then he got up, apparently satiated, and in the morning I woke up so beaten and crushed and annihilated that I could not move. Oh, my poor monsieur. Is there anything I can do? Mm, thank you, Marie, but no. No, I am not certain that there is anything that anyone can do. Uh, perhaps if we consult your doctor. <gasps> what? So he can prescribe more bromide, sends another course of shower baths? No. No, <laughs> he would be of no help. Then uh, what of Dr. Parent, uh, uh, whom your cousin uh, Madame Sable introduced to you? Marie, I fear that what I am dealing with is beyond the ken of any man. Then what is there to do, monsieur? I do not know. When one is attacked by certain maladies, the springs of our physical being seem broken. I am experiencing the same in my moral being, in a strange and distressing manner. I have no longer any strength. Any courage, any self-control, I have no power left to will anything. But someone does it for me, and I obey. Monsieur, please forgive me, but you must have help of some sort. This talk of invisible beings that control the will of men, it, it is madness. Madness? Why is it madness? The wind is the strongest force in nature. It blows down men in buildings. It uproots trees, raises the sea into mountains of water. It kills. It whistles. It sighs. It roars. Yet, have you ever seen it? Can it be seen? It exists, nonetheless. But the wind is a natural phenomenon, a regular feature of this world. These invisible beings of which you speak... Oh, until now they have never been heard of anywhere on earth. Ah, perhaps they are not even of this earth. Each night we see countless numbers of stars in the sky. Who inhabits those worlds? What forms, what living beings are out there? What do they know and see that we do not? Will they someday traverse space to appear on our earth and conquer it? Invisible beings. Other worlds. Oh, this is sheer speculation, monsieur, without any manner of proof. There are other explanations for your symptoms. There must be. No. I know what it is that stalks my very soul. Whatever it is, you must get away from here before it is too late. <laughs> I cannot. It will not let me. Oh, then you are lost. But I will be here with you, nonetheless. Good night, monsieur. He whom disquieted priests exorcised, whom sorcerers evoked on dark nights, whom we transient masters of the world imagined in the forms of gnomes, uh, spirits, genii, fairies and familiar spirits, he must have a name. What is his name? What's that? I can hear him shouting it out in the distance as he seeks me out. His name? It is Zehola. That's it. He is Zehola. August 1st. Finally, I know the truth. How can I help but know? It's obvious. The rule of man is over. And he has come. Yes, the Horla. He haunts me. 
He is within me. He is taking over my soul. I must kill him. But how? How? Perhaps the next time I feel him close, I will have the strength of desperation to strangle him, to crush him, to tear him to pieces. But what if mere human fortitude is to no avail? No, no. I must have a plan. Monsieur? Yes, what is it? I've, I've paid the workman, just as you instructed. Fine, fine, thank you, Marie. An iron door. And half-inch iron shutters? Yes, what of them? They, they are to keep this uh, invisible creature out? They are not to keep him out. I want to keep him in. Monsieur? Never mind, Marie, good night. Monsieur, please, let me call the doctor. Perhaps he can help. I said good night. Yes, monsieur. Good night. Yes, to keep him in. Tonight he'll come, and I will be ready for him. He's here. I can feel it. At last he's here. Ah, but I don't want to alarm him. I will casually close the iron shutters as if I am preparing for bed. And now I'll start to close the iron door as if I am shutting myself in for the night. <laughs> but instead of shutting myself in, I'll shut him in. Yes, it's done. He's locked inside this room and cannot escape. And now to destroy him. Oh, this lantern, yes, fire. Fire will dispose of him. The house is as dry as tinder. It won't take long. The flames, they're reaching the ceiling already. I better get out before I burn myself up too. I can watch from here. A tongue of flame licking out from the top window. And another. Oh, look at it burn. Oh, my house. My beautiful house. No, 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 no. It is more beautiful now, now that it is in flames, because he is inside. And he will burn, too. He'll burn, and then I will be free. <laughs> free of the whole... Uh... <laughs> fire, fire. The whole house is on fire. <coughs> That's a housemaid, Marie... The servants are trapped. We have to do something. <coughs> the roof has fallen in. The roof has fallen in. <coughs> it is over. It is the end for him. He is dead. Or is he dead? Perhaps time alone has power over that invisible and redoubtable being. No, a spirit would never fear premature destruction. Only we fear it, for all of our human terrors spring from it. But him? No, no, he still lives. And after us, who can die any day by any accident will come the Horla, who can die only at his own proper hour because he has touched the limits of his existence. No, he's not dead. But what can I do? What can I do? There's only one thing I can do. I can destroy myself. Yes. Yes. I must destroy myself. I must destroy myself. I must destroy myself. Get a straight jacket on him, quickly. Let me go. No, let me go. Don't you understand? I must destroy myself. Let me go. So ends The Horla by John C. Alzadek and Dana Perry Hayes. Tonight's story of Suspense.